Psalm 139. We're going to take a one-week break from moving through the book of Acts, which obviously has been a fantastic study for us, but just felt a, what I, I think was the Lord impressing me this week that this psalm would be helpful in light of a number of situations that people are facing in our church, where it's helpful to be reminded of the truths that this psalm gives to us about God, to be drawn to the Lord in the way that David does through the verses of this psalm. So let's read it together. Very much looking forward to just hearing these words, letting them wash over our hearts, realign our hearts towards the Lord this morning. Let's, let's read Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Amen. I'd like to recommend a, a book this morning. I'm, I'm sure some of you have read this book, uh, but I'm going to have the author join us a number of times this morning through his quotes. Uh, it's a book that if you haven't read, I, I would encourage you, no matter what else you're reading, to make this a priority over the next six months, that this would be a book you would read. Few books have had a more profound effect on me and on many, many Christians as that of Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Packer says this, What were we made for? To know God. What aim should we have in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? To know God. What is the best thing in life? To know God. What in humans, listen to this, gives God most pleasure? Knowledge of 
himself. To know God, Packer says, is the best thing in life. It's the thing we are to aim for in every moment. Knowing God is the most precious, the most valuable thing we have. It's the most important thing we need. But let me press this into the details of our lives for a moment. Let's say, let's imagine that you're in traffic this week and you realize that you are going to be late. You're going to be late. What do you need most in that moment? Temptation, frustration, the worry about the boss or the spouse or the child or the friend that's not going to see you on time. What do you need most at that moment? Packer would say, you need to know God and to walk with him. Let's say that we hear, you hear that they're downsizing at work. And it's a possibility your job might not be available that much longer. Your financial future is uncertain on human terms. What is needed right then, most of all, to know God, to walk with Him? Let's say that you suddenly realize you have been in a perpetual conflict with your spouse for some time. What do you need at that moment to know God? to walk with him. Let's say that you hear the news, as a number of my dear friends have, that your child is facing a dangerous illness or physical danger. What do you need right then to know your God and to walk with him? St. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. This psalm, like all the psalms, really like all of the Bible, is an invitation to know God. It is God revealing himself through the pen of David, describing himself, speaking freshly to us this morning so that we can have the thing we most need, the thing we were made for, the knowing of God. And I don't mean by that the knowledge about God as though it's merely a list of facts or a book you can read and pass a test. I mean the knowing of God as a person, the encountering of God, the knowing that this person who is our God is this way and not that way. The knowing of what he is like to the degree that our minds and our souls can possibly stretch out as far as we can to try to understand a fraction of him in truth, the knowing of God. Now, David was not a man who was free from suffering. In fact, one, you could say his life was filled with moments of extreme difficulty and pain and challenge. This is not the psalm of a man who is unaware that people face challenging moments when other things seem more valuable than knowing God. When certain physical solutions seem more valuable than knowing God. When having your family in order seems more valuable than knowing God. When, when a certain type of person being removed from your life seems more valuable than knowing God. He's aware of those kinds of thinking. But what he writes in the Psalms and in Psalm 139 is that the knowing of God is the most important thing he needs and what he wants us to see. He wants us to know God. God as he is in this Psalm. Now this Psalm very simply breaks down into four sections and all of them point towards this truth. Our greatest need and joy in every moment is the knowing of our God. This Psalm is basically David's overflowing heart at the awe of studying his God. It's been called a hymn, a hymn that's declaring God's greatness. Actually, commentator Derek Kidner says this, any small thoughts that we may have of God are magnificently transcended by this psalm. Yet, listen to this, for all its height and depth, it remains intensely personal from first to last. This psalm invites us into the overflow of David's heart as he studies his God and invites us to do the same. All right, four sections, four truths about God that David invites us to see and be affected by. Truth number one, he knows us. He knows us. Verse one, Lord, you have searched me and known me. 
You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it all together. You hem me in, David says, behind and before and lay your hand upon me. David considers himself encircled inside and out with the knowledge of God. He is hemmed in by God's knowing of him. So who is this God? that we need to know, that is most important that we know. It is the God that knows you and me. He knows me. He knows you. He has hemmed you in behind and before. He knows your thoughts. He knows your words before you speak them. He has, as it were, searched you out to the very depth of your being and found out all that can be known about you and me, God knows. Derek Kidner again says, this divine knowledge is not merely comprehensive like that of some receptor that misses nothing, capturing everything alike. It is personal and active. Personal and active. I think that's part of the point when David says, you hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. So God is not a traffic cam that captures every aspect of our life inside and out and just records it. For his awareness, though, he is personally knowing each aspect, everything we will say, everything we think, everything we fear, everything we doubt, every dream, every regret, every random thought on the way from the the table to the fridge, mid-meal. God captures all of that by personally observing it and knowing it ahead of time. He knows us. He knows us. So what do we know about God? First of all, that he knows us. And Packer, our friend J.I. Packer, says that it is God knowing of us that is the foundation of us knowing him. If God didn't choose to know us, there would be no way we could know him. Because he couldn't reveal himself to us in a way that we could possibly understand. If God didn't know us and our limitations and our weakness and our vulnerabilities, most simply as a human that is finite, then the infinite God could never reveal himself to us in a way that we could grasp or even appreciate. So his knowing of us is the basis on which he can reveal himself to us. Packer says this to comfort us with the good news that he knows us. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off of me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. He knows you and me perfectly, comprehensively, personally. There is a certain temptation, I think, to doubt and despair that comes in feeling that no one else knows. No one else knows. And this is true at some level. In in the human realm, as sympathetic a friend as we might have, uh, it is true. Even, Even the scripture says, no other heart knows the sorrows that a heart carries. Only, only the individual knows the depths of their own sorrows and burdens. But the scripture says, outside the human realm, there is a being that does know our doubts and fears. And and, and I've found, even in in counseling and with my own heart, there's a kind of a false security that comes in, in the mantra of loneliness. I'm all alone. No one knows what I'm going through, what I'm facing. Nobody knows the depths of my dreams. I can't really reveal to anyone else what I'm really feeling, what I'm really thinking. No one else understands that. And there's a kind of a, a, a false security that that kind of cynicism brings. It's, it's better just saying that because I don't expect anybody to know. It's better just declaring that it's, 
It's, it's, it's just true. I'm always going to be lonely. No one's going to understand me. I'm always going to have parts of me that are unexposed and unrevealed. And it's just better to admit that and live life without those expectations. And there's a kind of a, a false, almost cynical, rigid, false security that comes in that. The problem with it is it's simply not true. And like all lies that our heart tells us, it, it doesn't actually provide comfort. It provides a kind of bravado with an emptiness inside. And if you've ever encountered cynicism in your own life or in the life of somebody else, that's what it feels like. It's a tough outside with a vulnerable inside. It's a tough shell with a big emptiness. I'm lonely and I'm going to stay that way. But the scripture says, no, you're not. God knows you to the depth of your deepest sorrow. God knows you. The very depth of your heart. And it's a fearful thing since we're not perfect. But it's a glorious thing as vulnerable individuals. God knows you. He knows you. There is nothing about you that surprises God. He's never learned anything about you. He knows everything about you ahead of time and moment by moment. He knows me. He knows you. God knows every burden that you bear. The ones you think of are foolish. You can't believe they keep coming to your mind. He knows that burden. The ones that have been in the back of your soul for decades. Regrets and worries and wonderings about the future and dreams and little wishes that have remained unfulfilled and little comments people made that stung and lingered. God knows all of those things. He knows it all. And in the context of this psalm, though I think certainly this has application for those that don't follow Jesus, the context is David as God's chosen, anointing king, in covenant with Israel. So this knowledge, I don't think it's primarily even uh, just sort of his general omniscience that he knows everything. He does. He knows every thought of every person, saved and unsaved. He does. And that's a fearful thing. But I think in the context, the accent is on God's decision to know with affection and covenant love those that he has claimed as his own. His intentional decision to know you personally in, in, a, in a covenant of love and commitment through Jesus. He's decided, if I can say it that way, to personally know you in the context of this loving relationship. He knows us. Second thing about God that we learn, he is with us. He is with us. Down there at verse 7, David, thinking about the comprehensive knowledge of God, throws out some rhetorical questions as if to ask, would it be possible to go somewhere where God could cease to be aware? We would be, as it were, off of God's radar. So he asks these rhetorical questions. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? And he thinks first up or down. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's a, a Hebrew term. It, it basically means that the, ab the abode of the dead, the place where dead people go. But he says, e even there, you are. You are there wherever I go to heaven or in the place of the dead. You are there. If I take the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, probably what David's doing here is he's looking as far east as he can look and as far west as he can look. As an Israelite, the Mediterranean Sea would have been west. So he's basically looking across the horizon and saying, that's where the dawn is, the wings of the morning. And if I could flash across to the extreme west end of the sea, either place, if I did it in a blink of an eye, you would be there with me all the time. So as far up as I can go to heaven, as far down as I can go into the depths of the place of the dead, as far east, as far west, you are there with me. I cannot be anywhere that you are not there with me, he says. Perhaps, he says rhetorically, if I say surely the darkness shall cover me. Perhaps God's like us where certain situations conceal us from him and we're blinded, covered over as it were, concealed by darkness. But he says, no, that is not the case because to God, the darkness is as bright as the day. Darkness even is as light with you, God. 
There is no hidden place from God. There is no secret place from God. There is no place where God does not see it as clearly as we would see something in the middle of the day. God sees in the darkest night. So in the darkest, most concealed place we can possibly imagine, God is staring at it with his glorious light blazing on every portion of that situation. Now, of course, there's application that could be made here about the, the, the fearfulness, and rightly so, the trembling that should strike us at this truth. But I, I, the primary application I wanted to make this morning was on how, how comforting this is, especially when we translate this in terms of the New Testament truth. And we look down there at that wonderful opening of this, of this section where he says, if, if, if I go to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. What, what David is saying is, even in the place of the dead, your presence, somehow by faith, David, with his minimal Old Testament teaching about heaven and the afterlife, he, he still understood this by faith. God will still be with me. And in the New Testament, we have it even more clear that because Jesus died for sinners and was forsaken, they are with the Lord the moment they die. So that when they die, when you and I as a believer, if we die, we are immediately with the Lord. So that the place of the dead for us is to be in the unveiled presence of God. And certainly in heaven, that is the essence of heaven, is to be with our God. This is what David is saying. He's saying, God, God is with me. God has decided to be with me without exception. Th this is what the New Testament means when it says we are united to Jesus Christ. It means we are never away from his presence. When the Lord said, I am with you always to the end of the age, what he's saying is, you will never be away from me forever. You will never be away from God forever. God is not merely collecting information about you and observing you from a distance. He is personally with you and me at every moment. So in traffic, in your car, wondering why this person is staring at nothing on the side of the road, God is sitting there with you. When you're in the middle of this difficult moment with your child, and you can't understand why they are so frustrated and emotional right now, and you're trying to think, what do I say next? God is there with you. When you get news in the hospital that it's going to be much worse than you thought, and you don't know how you're going to handle this because you're not sure if insurance will cover it, God is there with you. When you sin again in the same way and you're not sure how you can possibly ask for forgiveness again, God is there with you and he will be with you after that moment as he was before that moment. This is what was purchased when Jesus died on that cross. This is why it's so valuable to us. Jesus was so categorically forsaken so that we could be categorically in fellowship with the Lord. He was cut off so that sinful people could hear this truth. I will be with you. When you die, I will be with you. You, you cannot even die away from the Lord. Nothing and not the strongest things in life can separate you from the presence of your Lord. He is with you. He is with you because those things that should have sent us away from God were heaped on Jesus. He bore them painfully, agonizingly on himself. And in that agony, he purchased the promise of God that we cannot flee from his spirit. We cannot leave his presence. And even when we close our eyes in death, we will open them to see the face of our Lord. Why? Because Jesus was forsaken on the cross for our sin so that all that is left was for the Godhead to link himself to us as closely as the Father is linked to the Son. This is what Jesus prayed 
At the end of his time ministry, before he went to the cross, he prayed that they may be one with you and me as I am with you, Father, as you are with me, that we all may be one and that they may see my glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. This is what Jesus prayed. It's what he died for, that we would be linked and united permanently and irrevocably in spite of our sin, in spite of our weakness, in spite of our worries, in spite of our burdens. We would never be separated from our great shepherd. He is with us. He will never leave us. One of my sons at one point in his life was experiencing uh, nightmares. I don't know what the difference between nightmare and night terror, but they were intense dreams. And he was asleep, but he was intensely agitated, anxious, worried, upset. And he's a heavy sleeper, so he doesn't wake up easily. So he's in this dream. And, and there was these moments where I would be standing next to him, kneeling next to him there by his bed. And I'm just aware that in, in his experience, it seems as though, I'm sure, there's terrible things happening. And it's devastating and worrisome. And all he can see in his dream is badness. But it struck me that in reality, I am right there. I'm right there. And I understand that, that emotionally, emotionally, it is painful and hard and difficult for him. And he's seeing things that, that it doesn't seem as though that I'm there to protect him. But the reality is I am right there watching over him. I would let nothing happen to him. Brothers and sisters, that is the reality of our life every moment, every day, every night. Our Lord is right there there. And we might be tossing and turning, and how can this be good? And this is terrible news, and I don't see how that's going to work out, and this is desperately bad, and, and I feel weak and vulnerable, and I'm helpless in the face of this danger and this difficulty. And the shepherd says, you cannot go anywhere away from my spirit. You could go to the heights of heaven, to the depths of the earth. You could go as far to the east as from the west. My Loving presence is right there, covenantly linked to you, bonded to you by the blood of Jesus, and that bond can never be broken. He is with us. You are not alone. When you are crying with a broken heart, he is there with you. When you are aware that you have fallen in sin again, he is there with his forgiveness with you. When you've lost a dear friend or friendship or loved one, the Lord is not distant from you. He is with you, giving you the gift of his own comforting presence. He is with us. Third section. He made us. He made us. You notice that David makes a turn, verse 13, and this seems to be a foundational turn. You notice the word for there. It's a foundational turn in the sense that God did not discover us at some point in our life as something worthy of this kind of dedication and care. No, no, God was the one who created our existence with his own personal plan for us uh, from before we were born. So God didn't come across us at some point. He, he was the one that was foundational in our existence. We are God's project from the beginning, David seems to be saying, because all this sort of flows together. He knows us. He is with us. But don't think that this just started at some point that God said, well, that's an interesting person to get to know. No, God was with us from the very beginning, he crafted us. We are his project, his masterpiece, his creation is what David says. You formed, in 13, my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. He breaks into praise, as he often does in the Psalms. My soul knows it very well. I, I just want to make a quick point about the value of the Psalms. The Psalms teach us how to guard against an academic study of God. They teach us how to avoid merely being doctrinally correct Christians. 
We must be doctrinally correct, otherwise we'll be idolaters, worshiping a God who is not. But we are not to merely be doctrinally correct. We are to be doctrinally correct worshipers of the true God. And the Psalms teach us how to do that. Notice how David moves effortlessly from the truth about God. You form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And then verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Every time we study the Bible, we should be like that. I'm studying about what you're like and then I'm bursting into praise and affection for you. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And he keeps going. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. That's probably metaphorical language for the very depths of the womb that he's saying, look, deep down where nobody else could see, you were weaving me together. The, the, the terms in this psalm have to do with the intricate weaving that, that David would have known happened uh, by people in his community. The intricate weaving, he's saying, that, that's what it's like. God was, was weaving together DNA strands and sinews and, and p- putting together these chromosomes. And he, he, he was weaving me together. Nobody else was watching, but God was working. God was working. Your eyes, he says, remember darkness is as light. Your eyes saw my unformed substance when I was, I was nothing. I was nothing of any value. Your eyes saw them. And at that point, my days were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God wrote our days in advance of our birth. This is our God. He wrote your end from your beginning. He crafted your makeup with his masterful wisdom. Without any help or aid or counsel, the Lord put you together, both your physical existence and your ultimate lifespan. Notice he bursts into praise again. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. Again, David, notice David, the devotional man. They're, they're precious thoughts. The fact that God made him in the intricacies of his existence and God wove him together and numbered his days so that God's purpose for him shall stand and nothing he does can change it. It's already written in a heavenly book. The, the ways in which David would glorify God would, would, were already written, were established. His story was already written. And the day would come when he would stop worshiping God here and start worshiping God in heaven. And God knew exactly what day that was. And there's just a sort of peace and comfort as opposed to our anxiety. And what if I make this choice and that'll really ruin my life? And what if I make that choice? And Obviously, stewardship is a good thing and obedience is always the right thing to do. But there is a a grander sense of confidence that comes knowing the Lord made me just the way I am. Even my days were written in this book before one of them came to be. Precious, he says, are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more than the sand. You can imagine David looking out and remembering his many days in the desert, looking at that mountains of sand and imagining individual grains and saying, your, your thoughts are more than the grains of sand. They are infinite. They are beyond searching out. You can search me out, O God, but I could never search you out. Your thoughts, just as I consider the creation of one man, your thoughts are infinite. They are impossible to fathom or or measure their depth. If we look at the New Testament for expanded revelation, it's important to remember that God did not just make us physically. He remade us in the image of his Son, And he planned our days to encounter his grace and to see his glory and to be transformed into a believer so that one day we would see his unveiled glory in heaven. And he remade us so that our our disfigured image of God could be remade and we can walk in those days showing forth his glory. He made us and then he remade us. The Bible speaks of his careful, perfect creation as a way of showing God's ownership 
and the treasure he has in his people as his special creation, that which he delights in over and over, and it prompts David to love God in worship. I think this speaks to our worries about wishing we were a different person. Not, I'm not talking about wishing we were more godly. Of course, that's good to, to desire and, and take action towards. I'm talking about wishing we were a different person just in our natural being. I, I wish I looked different. I wish I had different strengths. I wish I had different weaknesses. I wish I had different natural capacities. I wish I had different ability to work. I wish I, I, had, I could sleep less or I wish I could sleep more. I, I wish I was different. David declares that to know our God, to know our God means to know him as our personal creator, as one who crafted us with perfect intention and skill, putting us precisely together as he desired us to be. It means every life is crafted by the Lord, designed for his purpose, showcasing his creativity and used by his wisdom to reveal his glory. It means every Christian should have absolute confidence that God made them precisely the way he wanted us to be and is even now renewing us to fulfill in our own unique personality and physicality the image of Jesus Christ. God did not make a mistake when he made you the way you are. He made me as a man or as a woman He made me with a certain intellectual capacity. He made me with certain natural strengths and weaknesses. He made me with certain physical traits and not others. He made me to be overwhelmed by the wisdom that he employed to make me just the way he wanted me. This also gives us a a healthier perspective about others, other people. God made them the way he wanted them to be in their natural dispositions. God made them the way he wanted them to be. It motivates us not to condescend condescend toward them nor to be envious of them, but to use their unique makeup as a way of enjoying and celebrating the glory of God. Now you notice this is very different from the kind of cultural you be you and other ridiculous sayings. You be you meaning you decide what you are. No, the Bible says you don't decide what you are. God decides what you are. But it is a cause for great joy and celebration, not because we replace God with ourselves and determine our own makeup and what we desire to be. No, we celebrate that God in his wisdom, which as David says, is far beyond his own understanding, has chosen for us what he wants us to be. We will not enjoy following God if we're still arguing with him for how he made us or how he made others. We will not enjoy following God if we're still arguing with him for how he made us or how he made others. The doctrine of creation, if we embrace it and submit to it, becomes a platform of joy and celebration. As long as we're still having an internal dispute with God, I'm not sure I want to be this way. I prefer to have different strengths. I wish I was this and not that. I'm good at math, but it's cooler if I was good at sports. I'm good at writing, but I wish I was good at science. I'm good at this kind of work, but it doesn't pay very well. Why can't I be good at at that? Why can't my spouse have different strengths and different weaknesses? Why can't my children prefer this course of life rather than this course of life that doesn't seem as as happy or pleasant to me? Why? Why, Lord? Why? I'm not talking about sin, just our natural disposition. Why, Lord? As long as that argument is there in our heart, we're not going to experience what David does when he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. Precious not because he understands them all. Precious because he knows that God does and he delights in entrusting that truth to the Lord. God's thoughts are precious not because we understand them all, but that it is delightful to say that God does understand them all and we can enjoy entrusting our own makeup to the Lord. He made us. Finally, he deserves all of our heart. 
Verse 19, I think to us, seems kind of abrupt, but I don't think it was abrupt to David. David naturally assumes that this kind of God with this kind of glory should prompt a a loyalty and a devotion and an affection, a kind of zeal. He's staring at God and he's saying, Lord, it offends me that there are people on this earth that don't love you and honor you the way they should. It offends me, he says. Now, David's an Old Testament saint where things were much more physical and we're called to physically love our enemies in a way that in some ways David was not. And so we have to see the difference between Old Testament and New. There was this physical metaphor of Israel where they were called by God to have physical enemies in different nations. That is reversed in the New Testament. We're called to love our enemies and lay down our lives for them because the the ethnic distinctiveness of the people of God is no longer present in Christ. But I think we are supposed to learn from David's zeal here for God. David looking at God causes him to say, God, would you remove, slay the wicked, O God? He wants nothing to do with those who defy God in their violence. He wants nothing to do in verse 20 with those who speak against God with malicious intent. He hates it that God's enemies take the very precious name of God as a vain, worthless thing. He declares as a way of saying his commitment, I hate those who hate you, O God. That they would hate you stirs up offense in my soul. How could anyone hate the Lord? He's saying, there is no compromise for me, God, with those who hate you. My loyalty is with you. I have no loyalty towards those who hate you. I have nothing to do with them. In fact, the only thing I can think of when I see that kind of behavior towards you is hatred. There's a a holy hatred for the kind of sinfulness that is displayed towards you, this delightful God that I've been worshiping. But you notice David is not, in saying this, self-righteous. He hates the kind of brazen, belligerent sin that is present in the culture, but he's also aware that he needs God to cleanse his own heart. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. It's, the word there is, has to do with testing. So purge me, as it were. Now, he already knows that God knows everything. You notice the, the wraparound from the beginning, verse 1 to verse 23. He, he already knows God has already searched him. So he's not asking God to know something he doesn't already know. He's saying, God, I invite this, and I invite you to show me what you see. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. He's saying, Lord, use your pervasive knowledge of me to lead me away from anything that would keep me from loving and worshiping you. James Montgomery Boy says, So taken was he with the greatness of God that he wanted nothing to endanger his relationship to God. So taken was he with the greatness of God that he wanted nothing to endanger his relationship to God. God deserves all of our heart. He knows us. He's with us. He made us. And he deserves all of our heart. J.I. Packer again says, The life of true holiness is rooted in the soil of awed adoration. Awed adoration. This psalm is designed to invite us into a particular kind of relationship with the Lord, as, as all the psalms do, as all the scriptures do. It's designed to show us here's what the real God is like. Here's what he's like towards you. If you have believed in him, if you have claimed Jesus Christ as your savior, here's what God is like. He knows you completely. He is with you without fail. He created you for his own purpose. And he invites you to give your heart to him in wholehearted and holy, zealous adoration. That is what God calls us to live in, brothers and sisters. And that is a comforting God to know. If the chief aim of our life is the knowing of our God, 
It's good news that this is the God we get to know. Consider for a moment that if God wasn't like this, we would still have no choice but to conform our lives to him. He would still be God. We would still be not God. So the fact that God is this way inclines us to a kind of eager, delightful, grateful rest in him. That's why I think Augustine, who spent a lot of his youth trying to find everything else that could pleasure his soul besides God, when he finally met God, said, Lord, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's why he said that. He said, look, there's, there's nothing, and trust me, I've searched it out, there is nothing that calms a restless soul more than being in fellowship with this God. This God is so precious. He's so worthy of knowing. He's so glorious of knowing, and he has, he has paid for our sins so that we can approach him without fear. He's brought us to himself. He's claimed us as his own. He's called us his own prized possession. In the Old Testament, it says that God treats his people as the apple of his eye. This is our God. So brothers and sisters, if you are walking through the life that was made to know God, but not knowing him moment by moment, when we do that, in the moments that we try to do that, we are, we are dysfunctional humans. I, I read about somebody recently. <laughs> who had a short-lived excursion in what they called the sunshine diet. And thankfully, it was short-lived because they changed their mind, uh, not because they experienced the result of what that diet would be. But there was a sunshine diet. They were going to eat only sunshine. I mean, even flowers can't make that work, man. And I'm telling you, your liver is not going to be happy with you either. It was a sunshine diet. There's a problem. People were not made to live on sunshine. Souls were not made to live apart from God. In all of our burdens, and there are burdens in this room, there are burdens in my heart, there are burdens, burdens in your heart. There are worries. There are temptations. There are patterns you can't seem to break. There are conflicts. Not because we're some unusually bad church. It's because we are a church full of people. There are burdens in this room. The Lord invites us to know him in our burdens because we were not made for a godless diet of life. And if we try to live that way, we will shrivel and shrink and poison our souls with every other false substitute. But if we drink at the fountain that is this God in all of his covenantal love secured for us in Jesus, our souls will flourish. Our lives will be what they were meant to be, knowing our God. Let me encourage you, take your burdens to the Lord. Know him in them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's particularly on my heart those that have felt lonely in their burdens that that thought has come to mind. No one knows my troubles. I am alone. Lord, I pray that the truth of your promise would speak into their heart right now. You are with them. You know every burden, every sorrow, every regret, And you welcome every person to your presence because of Jesus. Anyone who trusts in him can draw near to you 
and is with you because of your grace. So Lord, would you comfort those who need to be reminded that you are with them right now. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.